What is up? What is going on? All of my quarantined people. What is up, Glenn? Thanks for saying hey. First in the chat box. Um, I've never done a live here on YouTube, so I've got no idea how this works. And I don't want to waste your time. I want to jump into the topic. If you guys want to uh, jump though in some questions, I'll try to get to them later um, throughout the video. But I want to talk about decompressing for low back pain relief, right? So there's lots of different strategies and ways that people go about getting decompression or using decompression as a tool for back pain relief. I personally think that using decompression the right way can be very powerful. And I think what it comes down to is finding out which variation or which type of decompression is the best thing for you. All right. And that's a very, very important thing to hear because when you think of decompression or when you hear about decompression, you hear of things like inversion tables, right? They're very popular. If you've never heard of a teeter, um, it's basically you strap your feet in, you're on like this table, you go upside down, you hang, and it decompresses the spine. I've got a video on YouTube that is probably one of the most hated videos on the teeter table on YouTube because I don't like it. I don't think it works. I think it's too aggressive. I think that there's better ways of doing it. So what I want to give you today is a strategy that I use and I talk about it in Relief Academy. It's one of the ones that is in like the quick relief bundle that's in there. And it, it consists of spending time on your stomach. And it's not just being spending time on your stomach, but being strategic about it, right? And then after that, we'll kind of talk about some other options that you can do that might work better for you or that you might or how to kind of tune it or make it fit you better. Um, if it's not this specific way, then what other ways you can do it. So as you can see me here, I'm on my stomach, right? So I'll spend time when I was at my worst. This was something that I did a lot, right? I ruptured my L5S1 disc. I've been diagnosed with degenerative discs above the site and have never had it fixed. Do not take pain medication now. Have never been prescribed anything. Um, other than Tylenol, Tylenol and ibuprofen, and I have my fair share of ODing on that stuff. But this is what I did after a while. I spent time like this, and actually, this was extremely painful for me at first. Even this here, like I was doing this, and that would hurt. Like I, it took forever for my lower back to relax. So I'd get into it, and I'd have like when I was seeing chiropractors, they'd like, okay, just lay on your stomach and try to relax, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna crack your back for you. And like I couldn't get it to relax. I could never get it to relax because it would always be like spasming. I always had this underlying issue of sensitivity, irritation, and then so I kind of jumped into doing things with with a PT uh, like traction, which kind of led me to what I'm gonna show you here in a minute. Um, led me to traction and actually getting traction professionally where like you're actually in strapped in, you've got those bars under your back, you're on your back and you got that cable and that belt hooked to your hips and you're, and it's like, eh, it's pulling you apart and it feels great. It feels really good. But despite rupturing, despite the decrease in space between my vertebrae, they were saying, Hey, you should probably try decompression because you have a decrease in space. If you open it up some, it'll give you some space to get in there and, bring healing or reduce the inflammation. And I did that and, it, and that never worked. So I had to find ways to use decompression because I believe in it in ways that can fit me specifically, right? If you have had a fusion, if you have had any kind of um, operation on your spine, if you do not have any, if you have not had an operation on your spine, or you have undiagnosed or, or non-specific low back pain, You everyone fits in the same category. You have to find which way is going to fit you best. But the best way, in my opinion, from my experience, to promote healing, to allow the mind to just shut off and make that connection to the lower back and that whole area to relax is to get in the most neutral position or safest position that your body feels is the best for it. All right? And one way that I was going to show you today, so 
I start, I started like this, right? And you can try this out. Um, go back through this. I would sit like this, lay so my stomach. After a while, this kind of got a little bit better. So I started moving up to this, but this really isn't traction, right? I'm just, it's kind of causing some extension in my lower back, which could cause some issues for people. So if we focus just on the decompression element, what I do is I will grab a collection of pillows. These are my pillows. What I'll do is I'll take this nice, beautiful pillow that my wife's probably going to kill me for having out here in the gym, but I'll put it under my hip, right? So I'm here, not, not here. You can do this as a whole other strategy. You can have it higher up here. If you're working at your computer, you can do stuff like this. But I'm talking about simply a gentle variation of decompressing the lower back. And this is what I would do, right? What I would do is find the smallest amount of pillow and start from there. At first, it was kind of like a rolled up towel, right? A small rolled up towel. I'd have, I'd have, to, I'd have to play with it. Because towels, you know, aren't that thick. Like once you roll them up, they're that thick. So you didn't want it on your stomach because then like your stomach will start hurting and it kind of feel weird. And you want to do this for time because you're going to do some things while you're doing this position, which I'll talk about here in a second. Some very specific things you want to do while you're on your stomach. I would, but I would find this is one that I would start with. It's a lot smaller. Um, I would lay here, position. I'd probably hang out as long as I can, try to relax. Um, and see how that felt. If it really wasn't giving me that relief, I still felt like a, a, a catching or a pain but in my lower back. I would pull it out, try a fatter pillow, do the same thing. If the fatter pillow didn't work, I would then stack them. So you're basically building up. So what you're doing is you're taking yourself from a neutral laying on your stomach or on your tummy to being in like this gentle, rounded, kind of flexed position. Again, if you've been fused, and you have your lower back fused, or if you have some hardware in there, you have to keep this stuff in mind, but you can still tune it to fit you. Again, this is not a stretching thing. You don't want to think of this as like, okay, I'm trying to get as much curve as I can so that I can stretch the area because it's gonna feel good. That stretch reflex is gonna feel really good. So, but what, because what you're doing is you're trying to bring some space into that area without being too aggressive. Being too aggressive like on a teeter table, being too aggressive like hanging from a countertop. I've got other videos that talk about decompression and even those are aggressive compared to this. Always start with this strategy here and then work your way up. So once I got a thicker pillow platform, I'd relax like this, right? And I'd position it, I'd work with it, play with it a little bit, position it to where I could relax and this right here feels really good for me you know and I'd relax my lower back I'd just kind of chill and this is where the the strategy comes in because once you've found that position where you can relax completely and trust being in this position like your mind and body trusts and it's not going to cramp up once you're there you can kind of see what's comfortable for here if you need some pillows in your face if you want to lay flat like this you can do that but once you have found your comfortable position your focus needs to be on your lower back, and then you're going to start breathing, right? So you're focusing on deep breathing in this area, and I'm not just breathing in. There's lots of different ways you can strategize with breathing, and I'm not going to say one is better than the other. If I'm just thinking of like mindfulness breathing, like meditation type breathing, where I'm, which is a whole other video in itself, I'm going to focus more on expanding my ribs, right? So here are my ribs. I'm going to go... So I'm almost trying, I'm trying to breathe into the base of my ribs, not deep into my stomach, not into my chest. Obviously, you're at the base. That's normal breathing where you should be at. What I did for a long time when I was using deep breathing and this for a strategy is I would think about breathing into my feet, like into my butt. I'm talking about deepest breathing I can do because basically what I was doing is my body, my mind would shut off basically from here. It would stop and all this would be super tight, right? So I had to relax and tell my, my body to just stop, just to chill out, just to relax. It was always tight, always stiff, lots of tension. So I did that by taking deep breaths deep into my butt and trying to relax that lower back, like forcing myself to relax that lower back. Um, and you really can't accomplish that by just focusing on your ribs, right? It's good breathing, 
But I want you to think about breathing deep into your butt, like deep, deep, deep down to your legs. So we are trying to breathe past. You're trying to breathe past that tight past where you've been fused, past where you've ruptured discs, past. What you're trying to do is find that comfortable place where you can match your breathing to where it's relaxing. And every time you breathe in and every time you exhale, everything is just, everything is just relaxed. I keep saying that word relaxed, but that's ultimately what you're trying to accomplish is you're trying to be able to find in the body to connect, to understand that you're in a safe place. Pain science and understanding the reality of how your body responds to pain, that's, that's just such a deep topic. And one of the best things you can do for starters is breathe and just give yourself the chance and the space to understand that you're safe, that you're okay. And this here, you have to do that. If you have chronic persistent tightness and stiffness in your lower back, this is one of the things that is a recovery acute um, relief type of strategy. So if you are in a, a lot of pain right now, um, I always say to spend more time on your stomach, um, but that may not be like this with no pillow. This might be aggressive, right? So stack up a bunch of pillows. Get you don't who ca who cares if you can't do the full cobra pose? Who who cares? So what you want to do is stack up some pillows and then relax and get that breathing right. Focus on that breathing. Um, so uh, other ways that you can do this. I mean, it's really not the the season to give you other strategies just because you know you don't have access to but so much right you don't have access to a pool because obviously if you're stuck at home or in, you're in an area that is has you quarantined but a pool is a really good place to do this as well like once you get back to being um able to swim in a public pool um, or if you have a pool at your house really cool um jump in a pool and you become pretty much weightless so what i did then in those situations is I would do deep breathing into my butt during that time. When I was in the pool, completely relaxed, I wasn't afraid of getting a catch. Oh, I wasn't afraid of like any kind of weird spasm or catch in my lower back because I, I felt safe. And that finding ways to incorporate safe breathing and safe relaxation outside of exercise is critical, it is critical because if you always spend time in this sympathetic nervous system where you're, it's this fight or flight response, if you're in a chronic pain situation, that's pretty much always firing. You're always experiencing that pain, that fear, that anxiety of, is this going to make it worse? Is, am I going to be okay? What's going to cause the pain? So the more investments and the more time you can put in your bank of, um, I guess of mindfulness of relaxation, the more you can start you the more you're gonna teach your body to relax, teach your body that it's safe to do what you're doing. Um, and it's not an overnight thing. Uh, this is definitely one of those things that if I've been at work or if I've I mean if I've been standing all day, if I I just I say standing because I when I was a personal trainer full time in a brick and mortar gym, um, by the end of the day my low back would be so stiff, so tight. It is it, it's as if I was like, my chest was out, my butt was out, and my abs were just completely rounded because my back would be so tight. So I knew, well, not at the time, but eventually I learned that stretching, <laughs> that sensation of tightness is the worst thing you can do, 100% worst thing you can do. The best thing you can do is get into a safe position. Is that on your back with your feet at 90? It could be, and if it is, stay there, hang out there, do that. Um, if it's on your stomach, I think for the most part, most people who have a history of chronic low back pain need to spend more time on your stomach. Um, it's just a matter of tuning it and finding out which position feels best for you, okay? So let me see if you got any questions. If y'all have any questions, let me know. Let me know if you like these lives. I'm eight weeks post surgery from my fears getting on the ground and not being able to get up. Any suggestions? Also, how do you reduce muscle tightness in your back? So, eight weeks post surgery from T10 to S1, my fears getting on the ground and not being able to get back up. Awesome. So, there's no, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. 
being on the ground, I'm just on the ground here because I'm just showing you um, I'm on the ground. Like that, that's just, this is, this is my area of influence right here. If you're on your bed, if you have a, and believe it or not, I've done this before. I have a table. I have a, a, um, a farmer, a farmer's table, farm, farm table, farm table, big farm table in my house. And it's at the perfect height. I could get onto it without any kind of issue. It's at that perfect height where I could literally just like hike my leg onto it, roll onto it, and like relax. Um, and I did that a few times. I went 100% and guilty of doing that a few times. And it worked for me. So but if you don't have a farm table, you can try a countertop. But And those are aggressive. I'm a very like frugal type of person in a sense of like I'll use everything and anything to accomplish what I want to do when it comes to you know this, things like this. So I would just start with your bed. See how your bed feels, right? If you have a firm or firmer bed, um, I would probably start there because you can stack up pillows on a bed as well. You're going to have to use more pillows. But at the end of the day, like if I were to take the sheet of paper, right, and you're here, this might this is neutral, right? For us in the world of pain, we're told, "Oh yeah, be neutral, be neutral." Like we want to be perfectly neutral. Well, okay, well that's that's not necessarily true. But let's just say this is neutral. But if neutral is painful for you, what do you do? You have to do something else. So you have to see, okay, is this uh, <laughs> is slight extension good for you? Maybe it wasn't for me. I was flexion. I was cursed. Flexion and extension intolerance. That was bad for me. But um, extension, does, is that better for you? Who knows? On a bed, if it's already squishy, your goal is to get like this. You want some space in your lower back. It doesn't have to be aggressive. Again, you're not stretching it. I don't want you to be like, get your wife or your husband or your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever. You're like, hey, babe, like, you know, how do I look? And you're like up like this. You're so stacked up where you're like this. We don't, that's not what we want. Again, we want to find that comfortable neutral position that is a blend between extension and flexion that fits you. Don't let anyone tell you what your neutral is. You know what your neutral is. And the best place to find your own specific neutral is how you feel. How does your back feel? Do you feel safe? Are the symptoms reducing? Is it a, is it a place where you can kind of rest and say, okay, like, this is cool. This is, I'm chilling here. This is not a, it's not a painful place to be. I don't care what you look like. If it feels good, stay there. Stay there and breathe through it. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Focus, relax. Build confidence in yourself in that position. And that's what you should be doing. So use a bed. Try that first. Um, reduce muscle tightness in your back. A lot of it comes down to what we're talking about here. We can go into a lot of different strategies with reducing muscle tightness. Um, I know from the hip, like a shotgun approach, is looking at your strength training. What are you doing? Um, I just released, uh, what's called smart, the smart strength membership, which is a, a membership based workout community or program where I deliver every 30 days, a brand new back friendly workout. This is friendly for fusions, friendly for chronic low back pain. And it, it structures and teaches exercise in a way that is safe and productive for chronic back pain sufferers or people who have a history of back pain or people who just have, who are old beat up, not old as in like age old but they've been working out for a long time. They're beat up and they want a safer, more productive way of training. This is for them. So in there, I we focus a lot on essential strength to look good, feel good, be strong, build confidence, but also to build the strength necessary to relieve some of this tension. Because sometimes, again, from the hip, shotgun approach right now, some of this tension comes from weakness, right? It's a, it's a sense of like we're not confident in our in our ability to stand straight or, or hold ourselves up. We think our damage is too too bad that we have to like, kind of protect ourselves and that protection mechanism stiffens, tightens muscles, which can be an issue. So I always say to move more and focus on strength training, start from there. And if you're having pain with strength training, we that's what we have to unpack it. That's what we have to navigate. What kind of training programs are you doing? Are you following Tony Horton's or latest program? Are you following Beachbody's thing? Are you following Sh Charlene, Shailene, whatever her name is, Johnson's program? Who knows? Is it for back pain people? Probably not. Probably not. And I, I would never suggest you follow that if you have chronic situations. Um, so I'd focus on that. And I'll, I'll, we'll do another video where I can kind of specifically pull out 
some strategies that you can do. I don't want to make this too, too long. We're already at 20 minutes. Um, Lisa Williams, I like the video, live videos. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, hi, sir. I have Disc Bulge L3, L4, S1. Last two years onwards, please suggest some healing exercises. So this is kind of a loaded question. Um, it's not so much that an exercise is going to heal the bulge. So let's just put that away. There's not a specific exercise that you're going to do that's going to heal the bulge in a sense of like, you're going to make it disappear. One specific thing, since we're on the topic of decompression, which is a great topic to be on if you're talking about bulges and stuff like that, um, is bringing space, right? So early in my finding out or early in my diagnosis of having a ruptured L5 S1 disc, which is basically your sacrum and your lumbar spine, it's those last, that's that last joint there before your sacrum starts, or I'm sorry, L5 S1. That's at that joint there, that disc is what I lost. Um, for a while, I was having sciatic symptoms, and it could, and, and you know, we can talk about why I was having, was it a part of the disc? Was it a type piriformis? Who knows? But one of the things that I used during that time was to build space and get, try to bring gentle decompression techniques that worked for me to help with working on bringing some space and allowing the disc or whatever was in the way, if it was my disc at the time, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have that diagnosed because like, I'm tired of doctors pointing at me and saying I should have surgery. Um, but I worked on a lot of this stuff, like being, being here and trying to get myself to relax. And, and I stopped when it comes to my training. I stopped doing things like deadlifts, like loaded bar squats, things that were compressing my spine and going into flexion. Because not that it, that's necessarily dangerous. Don't think that, oh, I can't flex my spine. I can't squat. I can't deadlift. I do all those things now. But at my season of pain, where I was at at that moment, those things were not things that I should have been doing, right? So once I removed the dangerous things, all my pain triggers, the things that could potentially cause a bulge to be worse, that's when my symptoms started to go away. That's when things started to slow down and not be so bad. Um, and that takes time. It's not, and that's a big misconception about back pain relief is a lot of people think the Tylenol approach, you can, you can, you can apply the Tylenol approach to a headache the way you treat back pain. And it's just not the case. I have a headache, my arm hurts, my shoulder hurts, I'll take, I'll, I'll just pop two Tylenol and I'm good. But that's not the case with back pain unless you're taking like Percocet or some of that. But we don't do that here. If you're watching this video, we don't do that here. Um, so I had to use exercise and, and it's a slow thing. But if I stopped and I got the right training, if, like I said, if you don't, if you have no idea what to do, my first suggestion would be to go to Relief Academy. I have a course on my site. You can go to fitnessforbackpain.com forward slash relief academy. And that goes through everything you need to do. That's like, I want to tell you all the things, but we're going to be here for like three hours. Um, but from the hip shotgun approach, find space like this, decompressing, natural, breathe, start strength training, take out the positions, exercises that you're doing that are not good for where you are. And if you think about how a bulge happens, if your bulge is to the back, flexing, bending over is not going to be a good thing for you, right? It's, it's just not going to be a good thing for where you're at now. Um, so that's probably where I would start. I don't want to get too too deep into that because, again, I'm trying to keep this video kind of short. But um, we can kind of go over more of that later. And if you want more content, you can always go to um, fitnessforbackpain.com. I do have a – if you are looking to use exercise, if you want to say, okay, like, my exercises I'm doing now are causing my pain. I have lots of sensitivity. What should I do? Where should I start? Um, if you go to, um, yeah, what is the, uh, hang on a second. I just recently changed it. Forward slash, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Yeah. So if you go to fitnessforbackpain.com forward slash back pain workshop, back pain workshop, fitnessforbackpain.com forward slash back pain workshop. I cover all of the 
nitty gritty that the nuts and bolts of designing an exercise program for chronic back pain. It pulls out all the things you do wrong. It pull, it puts together the order in which you should be approaching exercise, right? From the warm up, from the core training, from the body, what you're actually doing during the workout and what you do after the workout. Um, that 100% is a great place to start. If you are wanting to approach exercise and use it for chronic low back pain, go to fitnessforbackpain.com forward slash boom, okay? Because that is going to teach you basically everything you would need to know. Um, at least get you started so you can kind of look at your own personal program and say, okay, this is working. And this is what I'm doing right. This is what I'm doing wrong. And if you're doing it wrong, you have to make sure that you start making those changes because it's a, it could be something super simple that has you all jacked up, right? And you don't want to be all jacked up for no reason. So fitnessforbackpain.com forward slash back pain workshop. That is it, guys. 26 minutes. I appreciate the people who are still here right now. I love you guys. I appreciate you. I will continue to do these things. If you want to see, um, what's up, Lauren? And you must do movements to get you moving in the morning. Ooh, morning. You caught me in the, oh, this is a great topic. Um, for a while, for me personally, I did a lot of like whittling my activities down to like what didn't cause me pain which is a good and bad thing. It's a good thing if you have in your mind, like, okay, if I get up, I'm going to set my, my morning up to where I'm just walking around. Like I have my clothes high up. I have my shoes on my, on my dresser or whatever I have. So I'm not like doing a lot of like unnecessary bending because that's when you can have run into issues where like you start getting inflammation or you start getting irritation early on before you even start getting your day started. Um, so Set your morning up to where you don't have to do the typical early morning unnecessary things. Bending, tying your shoes. We all have to put our pants on. But try to tune your morning activities to support a pain-free movement environment, right? Once you've done that and you have that in order, that's not for, okay, from here on out, this is what I can't, I can't do any bending for two hours. I can't. I don't want you to think that because I want you to in, instill that in your mind where like you are putting fear of movement because eventually if you're on the right program, you'll be able to work towards getting out of it, you know? Um, but what I tried to do early, early on when I was super sensitive is I would simply just try to roll over in bed without having a catch. That was my first rule of doing it. And that would consist of very slow breathing and moving to rolling over and sitting up. If I could do that slowly, I didn't have any pain. I would sit on the edge of my bed, like I'm sitting up on the edge of my bed, feet are on my floor, and I would rock my pelvis forward and back, not trying to stretch. If you're super sensitive, there's no, and this is causes more irritation, don't keep doing it, right? So you have to take what I'm saying with a grain of grand salt, is I'd rock my pelvis forward and back, okay? And just, just to get movement, I'm not trying to slam it. Cause again, I had extension and flexion pain. So I, I didn't want to do it for so much, but I'd go forward, back, forward, back while I was breathing, trying to relax. Um, after that in the mornings, I don't do too much movement. There was, there was a short period of time that I would actually get on the floor and do like cat Campbell. So I'd do stuff like this. So if I was super sensitive, I would sit like this, try not to just like let my, I didn't want to be like this because if I, when I was super sensitive, I had to kind of keep a slight brace. But I would gently take myself through very gentle movements. But in the morning, it's it's it can be very dicey, so you have to be careful. Don't feel frustrated or feel like oh I should be I should be better if you can't do a lot of that movement first thing in the morning because in the morning your discs are like full of fluid. Right, so any inflammation, any irritation you have is going to be worse first thing in the morning. So if you can do it, and I, and I can do it because my life is set up this way, but I can get up in the morning and go for a walk, and that honestly was the it is today the best thing that I should do and can do for myself. And I would suggest anybody do that because the problem is when you say, "Oh, do do cat camels, do do some of these things here," where you're getting into like some some hip ranges of motion. Maybe do some of these things you see 
people doing on YouTube. You start doing all this stuff and like you're just pissing your lower back off and it's not even seven o'clock yet, you know? So sometimes the best strategy is not to move outside of what you have to because again, if you're trying to keep things calm, keep things under control, you want to do it in a way that's going to be relaxing, right? Um, so I wouldn't look at it that I wouldn't be looking specifically for a specific movement. If the cat camel feels good and after you do the cat camel, you're like, okay, that, that was, that's progress for me. That feels good. Nothing made it worse. Pain still there a little bit, but it didn't make it worse. Thumbs up. Do that. Keep doing that. And if it's giving you results, keep doing it. The key is, and where people mess up, is they get too aggressive with it, whether it be hip hinges, whether it be cat camel, whether it be pelvic rocks, um, circles, like gyrating. <laughs> I, can't, I can't show you how to gyrate right now. But if I had a, a ball, you can sit on a <laughs> – I'm going to try, try to show you that. Sit on a ball, and you would basically gyrate your, your hip. The ball allows you to move. So you can gently sit on that ball and just move your spine around like this. I hope that's a good example. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm on a ball here. Um, but that's what I would do. I would try that and see how that how that works for you. Can your programs be used for people with joint issues? So when it comes to applying exercise programs to your specific situation, this is why I always tell people, um, because there is no, even if you were to go into a clinic, right, and you saw a specialist, a Stuart McGill, you know, back pain expert, they still have to start from some kind of foundation level. What they would typically do, or anybody would do, if you were to come to my studio and work with me in person, we would do a movement screening. I'd see how you move. Can you lunge? Can you squat? Where's your pain at? How are you experiencing pain? When does the pain kick in? What doesn't cause pain? You kind of go through these things. And that allows me to like fast forward to where I want you to go, right? Being an online coach, I have to kind of give somebody a rubric to follow. And that's, there's essentials to a, a exercise program, which these programs are fit the majority. I mean, I have a 70 plus year old female over in the UK following these same exercises that have, she has like had like six or seven surgeries by herself. Does she have to modify exercises? Absolutely. Not just because she has X piece of equipment or doesn't have X piece of equipment, but she may not be able to do this exercise. You know, if she does stir the pots, she's like, you know what? I can't do stir the pots. Like, what else can I do? Or, hey, I really can't do a whole lot of core exercises on my back. What are some suggestions? And this is where the magic happens. This, when it comes to exercise, this is why it's so important when it comes to community and being a part of a community that is open to communicate, to talk, to talk. Because what you need is once you have your program, um, you can have your program specifically for back, pe back pain people in mind. I would consider you, regardless of your back history, I would consider you a back pain student, someone who is trying to navigate exercise despite the situation, regardless. You have your program, you're following your program, and you're like, okay, I know for a fact I can't do this, can't do that, can't do this. This is where you the good and bad happens. The bad, when you're by yourself because you're following Tony Horton's thing. I, I don't know why I keep banging on Tony Horton. He's a cool guy. He's a nice guy. But Tony Horton, and you're following his thing, and it doesn't work, you have to come up with a modification. Yeah, they may have a stupid modification on the video, but it may not work for you because you have a specific low back issue, right? There's nothing wrong with that. You're not fragile. You're not a baby. You don't need to be like, you know, handheld, you're strong, you're capable, but you just might have to adjust it in a certain way. When you have a program that's connected to a community and, and someone who understands where you're coming from, you get where you want to go faster because you can ask questions. Hey, the, um, what's a good one? The ceiling press, the kettlebell, dumbbell, body weight, whatever ceiling press for your core. I, I just feel like a weird pain or my low back spasms. Okay. No worries. Try this variation of it because I know that this variation has worked for people with chronic low back pain or sensitivity. No, I'm like that didn't work for me either. What should I do? Okay. 
let's come off of your back. Let's do some warrior presses. Let's do some um, stir the pots. If that's too aggressive, then we go back to the warrior press type of thing. We do payload presses. Like that's where the magic happens when it comes to finding a program that fits you best, right? There is no, you can't go to, I, I can't go online and Google best workout for L5 S1 disc rupture and disc degeneration. I wish, I think for a long time I did that. I was, I was searching hard because even though I'd find things for this, I find things for this, my fear and my insecurities, which is totally fine. I'm still insecure in a lot of ways. Um, those insecurities, that, that, that fear, that worry said, no, nah, like I, I can't follow that because it's not for people who have a ruptured L5, S1 disc and degeneration. This is just for degeneration. So what do I do? I did nothing. I would just sit around and, and do nothing. And I just stalled. That's why it took me years and years and years and years and years and years to truly overcome my pain because I would just waste time and fear and not do anything. And that's a long winded answer. I apologize. Um, <laughs> I apologize, Karen, but yes, they are a great starting point. They are, they are a, they're a safe alternative to a strength training program that builds endurance and builds confidence. That is the 100% thing and in order to build confidence with a strength training program. And I'm not talking, I use the word confidence. I'm not talking about like, like straight up high school confidence. I'm not talking about that kind of confidence. I'm talking about the confidence in your body. Like trusting that despite having the spotty situation or despite um, LPL4 S1 bulge last year, despite SI joint issues, despite that stuff, you're going to explore movement. And you can build confidence with the right tuning of certain exercises. And with that in mind, you've got to start somewhere. Um, and it's... A lot of exercises can be modified to be made more gentle. They can be made to fit worse situations, better situations in a sense of like extremes. Um, like, I mean, I ruptured my disc and it's still ruptured. And I stand here legit. I've been sitting here for 37 minutes on my stomach like this. Let me know if anybody can do this and not have pain. I used to have a lot of pain doing this. You know, being here for 37 minutes straight. So, and it started with exercise. It started with safe exercise and modifying it and being a part of communities, getting educated, being knowledge, investing in my health um, to the point where I am at today. So, I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry, I'm kind of long winded, which is why I, I do a lot of <laughs> recorded videos. So, I was like, ah, I'll, I'll just erase all that five minute spiel. So, that's it. That's all the questions. I'm sweating, paper starting to stick to me. I appreciate y'all tuning in. It was fun. Um, you guys, I mean, there's still people here. I, I appreciate you guys. That's awesome. Um, super grateful. Grateful for all the people who watch, read my newsletter, and um, who are considered students who have purchased courses and stuff. Like it's just it's awesome. So with that being said, that's it on decompression. It's a long video. I'll do more. If you're a part of my Facebook group. Make sure it'll be everything will be in the description to this video. Once it goes live, I'll add like the link to all the courses. I'll add the link to the, the Facebook group. But number one thing, if you walk away with, with a free thing, it's for you is go get that. Um, get that workshop, get the exercise for back pain workshop, because that's going to be a great place to start with exercise. At least you can take what you've done or what you're doing now and compare it to the way I coach and the way I say this is how your workout should be, should look. And once you've done that and you've done the little comparison, you kind of looked at it and said, okay, this is what I'm doing right. This is what I'm doing wrong. Then you can make adjustments. And that's free. It's it's 100% free. I, I, there's tons of free content that you can check out that will work wonders for you. And that that uh, that um, that workshop, I'm sorry, that, that workshop at fitnessforbackpain.com forward slash backpain workshop is an excellent place to start. So Thanks so much, guys, and I will catch you on the next video.